Hello, and welcome to the Writers' Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little bit less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. Uh, my name is Zach Powers. I'm the Director of Communications at the Writers' Center. I'm also a novelist and a short story writer, which is why I get the, the joy today of speaking to our guest about a brand new debut novel, Vinod Busjeet's Silent Winds, Dry Seas. I keep wanting to say those, those in the reverse order, so I have to look at the cover of them trying to say it. Um, but Vinod, uh, thank you so, so much for joining us, and I'm wondering if I could just ask you to read a brief excerpt from the novel. Uh, I think you have one ready, so whenever you're ready, please give us a reading. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present this uh, novel. Uh, I will read uh, from uh, chapter three, actually, the first two paragraphs of chapter three, which is entitled, All the Same Source. When the ambulance arrived, I was standing in the middle of the room, the screaming baby boy in my arms, his excrement dripping all over my white shirt and elbow. My mother was rubbing cologne on the face of Mrs. Kajal Desai, the baby's mother, who lay silent on the brass bed shivering, her blouse soaked with perspiration, her sari in a mess. For more than 10 minutes, she had been writhing like an angry serpent on that bed, her mouth and throat struggling to tell mama something. The two paramedics rushed her into the ambulance. Mama took the baby out of my arms, asked old Madame Joseph, our Creole neighbor, who had just walked in to take care of me and ran into the ambulance, which sped off. I was eight years old. Madame Joseph grabbed the hurricane lantern from the veranda and led me to the dark bathroom, a shack to the, in the backyard, some six feet by six feet, with a water pipe hanging from the ceiling, no shower head. She let the water run full force over me, asked me to wait for her, and left. I stood shivering in the darkness. Through the holes in the rusty corrugated iron roof, I could glimpse a few stars in the moon. We had moved to the Desai's house in Rosebel village a year earlier, in 1956, when Papa, recently confirmed in his primary school teacher's job, was transferred there by the Mauritius Ministry of Education. During the day, buses plying the Route Royale which linked Port Louis to Maibu, drove by the house every half hour. Bus passengers and those in the much rarer taxis and private cars could not miss the hand-painted advertising board nailed to the huge mango tree in the front yard. Desai printers, wedding invitations, rubber stamps, etc. Thank you, thank you. So just in your own words, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Well, I am Vinod Basjeet, living in Washington, DC, originally from Mauritius, a multilingual and multiracial island in the Indian Ocean, off the east coast of Madagascar. I have uh, worked as a high school teacher, a development banker, an economist, and a diplomat, at the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and the Embassy of Mauritius, uh, respectively. And uh, following my retirement, I wrote this novel, which uh, we'll be discussing. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I, I wanted to, I'm glad you hit some of your background too, that you didn't have what we might call the traditional writer's journey of someone who starts writing from what, I mean, maybe you have been writing and I'm gonna ask that, but. What was, your, what was your writing journey, I guess? You, you've published your first book after a career in a non-writing field. Uh, and I really think I'm interested in this. And I really think maybe some other people who are not, didn't start writing when they were you know, 15 with their first novel and a notebook might be interested to hear what your journey is as well. So how did writing fit into your life, I guess, before you wrote this novel? Were you writing along the way? Along the way, uh, I had no time to write. Uh, you know, the, the job involved a lot of travel. However, I always carried a notebook with me. And once in a while, I would think back 
me memories, drive on memories, but I also take note of what I see during my travels. Uh, one of the things I did often, which I found helped me a lot uh, while writing this novel was, when people gave me the, their business card, I would, at the back of the card, write something about them to, that would help me remember them. So I would put something like, uh, you know, this guy reminds me of Jack Palance or Clint Eastwood. No, this kind, so this is what I did. Uh, and when I retired, actually, I did not begin with uh, writing a novel. I wanted to try my luck in Hollywood. <laughs> I wrote a screenplay, uh, attended some screenwriting conferences, uh, and pitched, uh, actually pitched my screenplay. But I realized very fast that Hollywood favors the young, the very young, and you needed contacts. And I did some research and I found out that, you know, writing a novel would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. So, so, so the novel is even more recent than your retirement. It's not even the first writing you did. When did you finally sit down and start writing this book? How long, how long ago was that, did that process? Well, I, actually, I started, you know, around 2010. Okay. 2010. Uh, I didn't write continuously because I had, uh, my daughter was, uh, were, you know, uh, was suffering and, uh, you know, we, ha we had to kind of look after that. So, but off and on, I've been, I've been writing, working on this novel from 2010 to 2016. Uh, the very first uh, workshop I took was at the Writers' Center. And it was a sort of general introduction uh, to kind of give me a sense of what's involved. And uh, following that, I, uh, to the consternation of some of my former colleagues, I enrolled in undergraduate workshops at George Washington University. And uh, I got into a competitive uh, evening workshop. So during the day, I would kind of, I would say, ma test market what I wrote with young people. And the evening, I would test market the same thing with adults. So that's kind of how I got into writing. So uh, was the writing, so reading the, no the novel and I'm assuming here we might talk about us in a bit that there does reflect some of your own experiences. There was definitely a uh, a broad liberal arts style education as well as sort of specific education. So, uh, are is that something that pl that that played into your ability to write? Have you stayed a lifelong learner in broad subjects? Did you keep that interest up even if you weren't necessarily writing? Were you staying interested in the liberal arts and the arts and the humanities side of things? You know, as two of the audience, two members of the audience who are from Mauritius there, in addition to my wife, will attest. Uh, we have an excellent education system in Mauritius. So I had read broadly. When I came here, I was surprised like, to see uh, English majors who had not read uh, Shakespeare in the original when they were in high school or Chaucer. I mean, so I had read quite a lot in in English and in French. And I was also exposed to the Indian epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So culturally, I had a sort of broad base. Uh, and uh, I am by nature curious, you know, in pre-COVID days, when I would go to the doctor, I would read people's magazine. I would read architectural digest. I would read what I, you know, I just was interested in everything. And I find that that helped me a lot in writing. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I always think curiosity is like maybe the most underrated writing skill. Like my favorite writers always seem to be endless, endlessly curious. Um, so what's one piece of advice that you might give to someone who hasn't been engaged in writing, who maybe is in a similar situation similar to yours, or maybe is still working, but want, has this idea for a book and wants to get it out? What would you say to someone looking at starting a writing project when they haven't been engaged yeah. Really I actively say, with writing along, yeah. all along. I said, don't do it alone. Enroll in a workshop, because that will provide you the discipline you need. It will provide you feedback. Uh, but also, you know, you will have a deadline. So the deadline forces you to produce something. So 
that's my first advice. Enroll in a workshop in the evening, so in the weekend. And once you kind of, you know, you've written something substantial, I would say, you know, take a week uh, or two week off and, and go to an intensive writing seminar. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that's, that's I don't think I've had anyone, ha had someone say it exactly like that. And I really love the don't do it alone advice and come to the writer center where we can help you out. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's get to actually some of the craft of writing a little bit. Thanks for sharing your, your, your sort of writing journey here, but we are, we are a craft chat and I would like to cover some of the craft topics. And one of the things that really blew me away in the novel um, uh, was the scenic details. This book is just really rich with, with detailed descriptions and really telling details and just very interesting details. Um, and I always felt well grounded in a place that I didn't, I knew almost nothing about. I've obviously never been there and knew almost nothing about. So I was being introduced to this place even as I went along. So first, how do details end up in your work? Uh, do, they, do details appear in your first draft? Is that something that just occurs naturally to you when you're writing? Did you add them in revision? Or do you have maybe so many details in the first draft, you actually have to start cutting things out to streamline the story after you've just crammed it full and full of details? I'm just interested in where details come from in your process. Yeah. You know, very early on, I decided that this novel was going to be a coming age novel of an individual as well as the country. So once you decide that the setting will be a character, that Mauritius was going to be a character in the novel, the scenes came naturally. There is no way you can write about Mauritius without writing the scenes. Uh, and it wouldn't I don't think it's a wise idea actually to add scenes after the first draft, because I think it will look artificial. It will look like appendage to the rest of the writing. So uh, the details came naturally to me and I had to get rid of a few, uh, you know, that makes me think of what the French uh, philosopher and writer said, Voltaire. Voltaire said, the secret to being a bore is to tell everything. And I heed, I heeded his advice throughout. Yeah. What what makes a good detail for you? What makes okay if you can't add all the details? What what makes you want to choose the details that you choose? What makes a scene feel real to you? Now, ideally, it should be a detail where you can call upon all the senses: the sense of hearing, the sense of taste, the sense of smell, the sound. That's ideal. Now, if you can, on top of that, uh, uh, have a detail that has a symbolic significance or a thematic significance, then you've really, you know, you've nailed it. Yeah, I so would, I would say make it sensual, sensual, symbolic, thematic. So how do details, speaking of theme, I'm really interested because I'm, there is, uh, a Proustian quality to the novel where memory, this is a novel of memory. Um, and there are very details, like memory and details are very tied together. And I'm wondering when you're writing from memory, do, do how, how does, how does, how do details conjure memory and how does memory conjure details? Or how are they related for you as you write? That sounds like a chicken and egg question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is. I, frankly, I have never thought of it that way. Okay. The way I handle detail is, uh, you know, I play around with them. Uh, I manipulate details from various time periods. And then uh, that leads to an interesting scene. I'll give an example. Uh, the memory, the, the, there's one memory of uh, my aunt confronting a young woman. Right? I take that, I, I write I, to the extreme, I, insert, I, I play around by inserting some brutal language. Then I have another memory in New York, you know, when I first saw the album of Carlos Santana called Abraxas, and on the cover you have this majestic black woman which reminded me of uh, you know, the woman my aunt confronted. 
Then I had another memory, the, uh, reading the novel by Hermann Hesse, Demian, coming of age novel. I manipulated the three memories in such a way that I produced a scene, which then became like a, a you know, a, you could say a, a meditation on the relationship between the carnal and the sacred. So uh, that's, that's how I did it in quite a lot of the scenes I had. But then there are other ways of uh, uh, dealing with detail. Uh, one is, uh, one detail is uh, the way you dress. In Mauritius, uh, people, you know, all, because of the various cultures, they are, you wear the sari, you wear the toti, you wear the suit, you know, uh, you have the special uh, cap that Muslims wear and so on. So maybe let me, can I just read a short poem to you? Please. Uh, that's a, also to give an idea of the, you know, the kind of, they also write, there's six or seven poems in the, in the novel. And uh, that one, it's entitled Reincarnation. And, and then I'll, I'll kind of comment, relate it to your question. The shop opposite the pharmacy smells of raisin and sawdust. The muscular carpenter planes, assembles, varnishes the coffins, which his blunt wife displays with dignity. As we pass by, Mama asks Papa, do you wish to be buried in a dhoti? I love my suit and tie. I don't want to be Gandhi in his loincloth. But you married me in a dhoti. If that's your wish, dress me in a dhoti. But place a suit next to me. If I wake up, I'll put it on. Now, uh, the dhoti here, you know, the reason I have it is about ring, is about, you know, this, the theme here I'm dealing with is tradition and modernity. You have this father who got married in his dhoti, but does not want to wear a dhoti because he feels to be modern, you know, he wants, to, he is not that, he has traditions that he respects, but that's a tradition he does not feel strongly about, right? So here the dhoti is, uh, I used it to develop that theme. Also in this particular context, in the Mauritian context, this happens right after a chapter dealing with political ethnic riots in Mauritius. And we're going through the, uh, a period when the dhoti became a bit like the mask in America today. Uh, it was, uh, there was a fear raised, you know, it was part of the, you know, one political party in Mauritius just said, you know, somebody in that party said that if Mauritius gets independence, the, the minorities will have to wear the dhoti. So this became like a, you know, it's political football. So, so I would say the dhoti here is symbolic, thematic. So, that's another way of dealing with the detail. Yeah, I mean, I, I noted like in my questions, just one of the one of the thematic details that came to me too was following the cyclone. Uh, the narrator uh, Vishnu is is sees the dead chameleons, which were animals he had seen before in this little tiny grove of of plants. Uh, and, but following the cyclone, they've been wrecked. They're dead. They've been decapitated and cut apart. And and uh, it was such a wonderful thematic detail in that moment too. So I think that's another thing that I was really impressed with uh, in the novel is that you, you really hit, you mentioned thematic details, but I feel like that's really a strength of, of the book throughout every time. Like there are some pretty details, there are some informative details, but details are rarely just doing one thing at a time. And I think that's also, we talk a lot about that with, I feel like we talk a lot about that with dialogue, like dialogue should do a couple things at once, but almost everything in fiction can do a couple things at once. And that was, that's where I was, that's why I want to start on details. I think the details are always just working in so many different ways when they come in. Well, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> um, so I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, please, please, please put them in. I think maybe one just came in. Uh, put them in the chat window, uh, and I will keep up with those and get to them as I can. Let me glance at this one. Um, Okay, 
So this is a person who is in semi-retirement and have completed a book and have been surprised at how very hard and how long of a wait it is to find an agent. Do you have any advice for finding their way through that process? Uh, their book is a fictional story set in an economic environment. Okay. Uh, it took me two years to get an agent. And uh, what I would say is, uh, if you can meet an agent personally, things go more smoothly. I attended a few writers conferences where agents were present and uh, where I would pitch my novel. So that's one way, that's kind of to me, if you can do that, that would be the best way. But I was surprised by how responsive agents were to my queries. Uh, there were quite a lot of agents who asked me to send their first three chapters after I sent a sample of 10 to 20 pages. And uh, I had more than 15 agents who requested the full manuscript after they had seen the first three chapters. So uh, I would say write to an agent, but make sure that agent likes, represents the kind of books you are writing. For instance, there are agents who specialize in economic themes. There are agents, I mean, agents specialize in different things, different, uh, on different topics, I would say, or have different interests. Yeah. I would say too, I mean, uh, to your point there, never query an agent who doesn't specifically list an interest in what you're presenting. That's yeah. rule number one of agenting, yeah. uh, that's, that's just, it's bad manners in the agenting world. They're not talking to each other about every submission, but it won't do any good to do that. Yeah, uh, for, yeah. yeah. For instance, there are agents who specialize in young adult fiction. I mean, it made no sense for me to contact those agents. Yes. There are agents who specialize in nonfiction. There are agents who specialize in on historical fiction. So, uh, so uh, it's pretty easy with with uh, Google to find out the interests that agents have. Yeah, and, and the other thing I will say, though, is it is a long, can be a long, slow process. And I usually say, if you're going to quarry one agent, quarry 20. Because if you wait for one at a time going through that process, that could stretch to years. Um, I, made a, yeah, I made a big mistake. I went to a writer's conference and uh, I met an agent who really loved my son. So I sent her uh, my manuscript. The problem is I didn't send it to other agents as well. And I wasted six months that way. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, and the last thing I'll say is because it's a mechanical process, try to separate it from your creative process, sort of do it. Don't, don't use your writing time for it. Go find an evening where you can spend a few hours and, and go through the details. And, and uh, there's, a, we could spend the next two hours talking about agenting stuff. So I don't want to quite go down that, that rabbit hole, but there's, uh, it's 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 work it's work and it's not fun and but it's the thing you got to do to to get published where you want to get published yeah. um so the next question in the chat is related to my next line of questioning so i will go with the chat question and maybe jump into uh to my questions in this topic too so is this an autobiography autobiography or autobiographical or is it pure fiction it's not pure fiction and it's not pure autobiography. Yeah, that was my that was my reading of it. I, I and it, there's a category of fiction now that is that's fairly prominent called auto fiction. And to me, this like I didn't know for sure, but this felt like it fell in into the vein of auto fiction. Yeah. The narrator shares your initials. I thought that was a not so subtle nod. My, ad <laughs> my advice to writers is don't write a character who shares your initials. <laughs> <laughs> Because you'll be asked whether it's autobiography or fiction. Now, I'll give you a concrete example. You know, uh, there are events I invented. Uh, for, for example, uh, in the novel, the narrator uh, writes poems which he submits to the school magazine. He writes one in French, he writes one in English. I never submitted anything to my school magazine. 
In fact, the only time I appeared in the school magazine was when my high school English teacher quoted one of the big mistakes I made in the magazine. I used, instead of saying atomic deterrent, I said atomic detergent. So that's when I appeared, that's the only time I appeared in the school magazine, that's an invention. Uh, there's a character called Madame Joseph who is total invention. Uh, you, in, you invent events, you invent characters, uh, you have to do it. Uh, well, do you have any difficulty weaving between sort of stuff based on, on experience and stuff that you're making up on the fly? No, I, I, I don't. I, I did a lot of what I call dramatic compression. <laughs> uh, in this one chapter, which takes place during a cyclone, three days. Over, so I compress events that take place over a whole year into three days to create to create drama. So that I've done quite a bit. I've, mm -hmm. I've fused four or five cousins into one cousin. I fuse, <laughs> you know, that's, you do that. that. That's the number one rule of, of, of auto fiction, I think, is merge some people together. That's good advice for any long form writing. If you have two characters that can be one, yeah, always make them one. It's always, it's always so much easier. And usually better. Usually, if, if two characters are are not necessary and one can do the work of both of them, it's usually a lot easier for the the reader to keep up and and appreciate that character. And sometimes that character too becomes way more interesting than they were than the individual ones were. Like the sum total is greater than the parts. Not to insult your cousins. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So, I just want to say too is that. I was impressed by that too, because whenever I write from like an, a memory, like if I write a scene in a book that's really based on something that actually happened, it never works as well as the stuff I'm just making up for me. Like I'm, my creative process relies so much on like being creative from start to finish. If I'm tapping into a memory, it always just, it always falls flat. I have a couple chapters in the, in the project I'm working on now that I'm going to have to like just cut and rewrite and make them up completely because they, 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 they stalled. So again, I'm impressed with the fact that you kept that going in such a forward, forward motion as you're going in and out of imagined and real. Dramatic compression. Yeah. Um, so what did you do when you got stuck, if and when you got stuck while writing? You know, the notion of writer's block is something foreign to me. I don't, my, in my experience, there is no such thing. Uh, if you can't write, you go for a walk, you go and see a movie, or you have a glass of wine, and then you come back. You come back and sit and you start writing. Uh, I, I, I don't know, it may sound a little bit arrogant, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I have not experienced writer's blog. It could be just fatigue. Sometimes you just need to get away from uh, the writing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a, a good good point right there. So another question, and this this may be a person uh, a personal question, a little more than a writing question, but I think it's an interesting one. You're not living in Mauritius. What is the Mauritius you carry in your heart and mind, from Carl? Oh, Carl. <laughs> Hi, Carl. <laughs> By the way, Carl, uh, Carl is, in, is a well-known writer in the Francophone world. I have, I have to mention that. Uh, his uh, novel has won universal appraise in the French-speaking world and is going to come out in the American uh, market next month, I think. Oh. What's the name of the novel? It's called Kaya, uh, the, the full title. I know it's, it's Kaya. Kaya is there. Ka is the, the main character is Kaya, K E Y A. And it's translated by Jeffrey Zuckerman. So, to answer his question, uh, you know, I used to go to Mauritius like every 18 months or so. You know, uh, I could uh, do it from 1979 to up to about five years ago. So, I saw Mauritius. Uh, evolve, you know, develop over the years. So my novel really deals with the Mauritius of the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, so that Mauritius is very much in me, but at the same time, 
I am not nostalgic about the Mauritius, you know, because I think that Mauritius have Mauritius has in many ways evolved in a positive direction. In some ways, it has evolved in a negative direction. But uh, you know, I like being in Mauritius now too. So I would say the past and the present both, but I just know the past better than the present. Great. Um, it's another question on character development. How do you develop different voices for different characters? Is it as simple as different choices of words or tone, et cetera? How do you establish that when you have different characters speaking? I, I you know, I do it, I don't know. Uh, I took acting classes when I was doing screenwriting. And the reason I took acting classes was partly to get a feel for dialogue and partly to get a feel for motivation. I think you can develop voices unique to each character if you go deep into the motivation of each character. I think that my main, I would say two for character differentiation is motivation. Different people have different motives. Uh, I do use language also, uh, the sophistication of language. Uh, you know, uh, a school teacher will not use the same language as a fisherman. Uh, so that's another way I, I, I use uh, language. Yeah. Okay. Uh, jumping back a little bit to the auto fiction question, uh, if it's part autobiography and part fiction, and if it has autobiographical elements, I should say, because I don't think it's autobiography at all. Um, did you find it hard not to bring too much of yourself into the novel? Were there times where you realized, oh, I just wrote, uh, I just wrote about me. That's sometimes I'm supposed to be writing about and pull it out and put in, in some, some fiction. Okay. You know, the interesting uh, sort of part for the novel is really, it's the narrator is looking, is talking, writing about people in his environment. There's a wide range of characters in that novel. So the novel is not only about the narrative. There's so much of it that is about the country, about the family, about the community, about the politics that, uh, you know, I did not have, uh, I didn't face this problem of saying too much about myself because I was so busy writing about family, about community, about uh, the different ethnic groups, about the culture, about the language. Uh, so that was not a problem. Right. Um, so talking about, we, we had a question about agenting, but I, I'm a little more interested in, in the publishing side of things right now and your personal publishing journey, because that's another part of this process that actually really affects the final product that we see here. And sometimes we don't talk about the fact that a lot of work goes on after you get an agent, after the agent sells it to a publishing house. Um, so how did this novel go, first of all, just, just the, the basic skeleton outline of how did it go from living in a notebook or on your computer to finding a publisher? So we've talked, we covered agenting already. So maybe go to from the agenting process on to, to finding a, a publisher. Okay, well, first, I mean, let me talk a bit about the input of the agent. Okay. The, the novel in its present form compared to the novel in the form it went to the agent, you know, there is, uh, what was the agent sort of input? My novel is written from the point of the narrator, you know, it's first person. However, the, the draft that went to the agent had one chapter written from the omniscient point of view, all knowing point of view, that was the first chapter. And there was a middle chapter where the narrator go, has a, suffers a breakdown and goes literally cuckoo. And it's difficult. I mean, then the, when the question I faced was how, how can I say something when the guy is cuckoo? So I, I took the point of view of a cousin. And what the agent advised me to do is put everything in one voice. So I used to chapter, I had to change the point of view of chapter one from omniscient to first person, 
in the middle chapter. So that was uh, that that involves some work. Mm -hmm. So that was the input of the agent. When it came to the editor, uh, there was input from the editor as well, in the sense that uh, one, there was one chapter you you could call it. I mean, so the sexual initiation chapter, let's say, right? And uh, writing about sex is not that it's not that easy, right? So there, uh, the editor, you know, had I would say uh, very useful input. And most mo most interesting to me was uh, the attitude of the publishing world to writing foreign languages into the novel. I have a poem there, for instance, in French. I have one poem which is a mix of Arabic, Sanskrit, Latin, and a lot of Creole words, a lot of Hindi words, a lot of French words. My initial uh, uh, draft had them all in italics or italics, right? And uh, I was, you know, my, with my editor, we worked it in such a way that now the, the italics they don't cover foreign language. So the foreign language is presented as if the same way as the English language, which I like because it, it helped reflect the, the multilingual nature of the, of, of the island. So that kind of, you read it, it's like, it's as if you are there. So there's, there's input from, from that. Mm -hmm. what, what was the biggest surprise for you go in this whole process of, of publication at any point along the way? It's, it's uh, you know, I was very pleasantly surprised by how, uh, you know, I don't like to use the word nice. I don't know what's the word, uh, how encouraging, you know, the people in the publishing world were once they accept your manuscript. It's really, uh, I mean, I, I, I love the whole process. process. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's got to be true, too. I mean, for as much as we gripe sometimes about the stuff leading up to the publication process, when it comes time to publish, the people who are working on that book liked that book better than thousands of other books they yeah, saw that really year. They really, really liked that book. Yeah. And so they 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 it is their product too. I mean, it's something. It, it is a it is a team effort. It's a yeah. team effort. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a that's a really great point to make too. That it's it's the people there. Uh, same same experience for me. Anyone I've worked with uh, on a publishing side of things is once you're working with them, so gracious. Sometimes it seems like that will never happen, but once you get there, it's 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 perfectly pleasant. Um. What's what would you say to a writer? maybe who's just gotten an agent, what advice would you give them uh, about what they maybe should expect or maybe they should know as they're about to head into the same process you just went through? What's something you'd want? What's something you wish you had known going in? Uh, dealing with, uh, and I, I think it will depend from agent to agent because uh, for instance, take communications. Some agents communicate frequently. Some agents infrequently. Uh, so I would say one thing, which is uh, my advice is first, yeah, it's good to find to figure out the, the, the frequency of communication with the agent. That, that's that's one thing that's to mm -hmm. me important. Yeah, that's that's good. And and you know, you uh, you have to realize that the agent, you you are not the only client the agent has. The agent has many clients, so. The agent is busy with a lot of other projects. So uh, don't just bug your agent at any time. You know? Yeah, um, uh, empathy is such a big part yeah. of, of the publishing process and recognizing that everyone's working hard and, and no one's intentionally ignoring you, that they're invested in the same way. Um, that's great. So another question from the chat, and this is a good, a, a good question always to hear. What's your day-to-day -day writing process like? Now, there is this uh, advice that you should sit down eight hours a day or whatever, or four hours a day, every day. I wish I could do that, I don't. So uh, I, I actually think 
uh, one should find one's own writing process. Uh, writing process. Uh, some days, I mean, there are some times I can work every day continuously with very little sleep and be very productive. There are times when, you know, I am not that productive. So I, I, I cannot say I'm, a regu I'm, a, I'm someone who writes regularly four hours a day every day. No, I have times when I'm very productive and I have times when I'm not that productive. But then I kind of take that, that's my style. I know other writers who are very regular, very, you know, it's different. So my advice to writers is you have to figure out what works for you. I think the only thing that I don't believe in any form of, of universal writing advice, but it doesn't have to be a strict, rigid routine, but you have to be end up writing more often than you don't end up writing. I yeah. think that's the only thing. This would be every day, but you have to end up and do some writing at some point. And as long as you have any sort of routine or not quite routine that allows you to do that, you end up in, in good shape with uh, finishing a product. Um, I was a little interested too, and I don't think I prepped you on this one, but I was interested in the plot of the novel, but also the plot of the novel, but also the plot of the chapters. So the chapters sort of all have independent identities, uh, more so than you see in some other books. Uh, but then also, then you have the bigger shape of the novel as a whole. So first of all, how do you, how did you approach plot in this novel? Was it something that was in the forefront of your mind or was it something that emerged just out of you having, trying to tell these stories? Okay. Uh, the plot was determined actually by uh, the writing workshops that I took. In a typical writing workshop, you don't produce a novel you produce a short story. So I had to think of a novel that would consist of many short stories, right? But at the same time, I had to find the narrative thread going through all the stories. So that was my challenge. So finally, I would say the novel was written the way a movie is made. Movies are not made sequentially. You know, movies are made, the last scene may be the first scene that is that they shoot, middle scenes, uh, so things are written at different times. So this novel, I was like, for instance, the first chapter I wrote was a chapter dealing with uh, the politics, uh, the, with, the, with the politics, mm -hmm. the, the first, uh, because that's something I felt deeply about and, I, and it was easy for me to write. The last chapter I wrote was the chapter dealing with sexual initiation, because that's the most difficult one to write. So my, my main concern was not about whether there's a plot structure. I mean, I know there's the advice you have to a protagonist and an antagonist. They have to, you know, clash, you know, have conflict. I didn't approach it that way. I, appro I approach it from the point of view of uh, that it should, what is important is that it should be a novel-like experience. If you read it and you, it feels to you like a novel, it is a novel. For the same reason, I, I inserted poetry in the novel. That's, that's interesting. Did you, w once you'd gathered the individual stories together, um, did you have to go back through to clean yeah. anything up? I, I, uh, I had to, find a narrative thread uh, that would link them together, yes. Yeah, great. Um, here's another question from uh, the chat. So did you include any, any economic concepts or language that's not well known? And if so, how did you help a reader to understand? And I might expand that. I do believe there, I don't, can't recall too much in terms of economic concepts, but there is definitely, um, I mentioned that I felt very well oriented to the island. So how did you, but also it never felt like you were writing an essay on this is Mauritius and this is, you know, it wasn't wooden or like that. So how, how do you make sure that the reader uh, has the knowledge they need, but you give, how do you give it to them in a way that feels like part of the story, part of the plot? 
But I avoided economic concepts like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first advice. <laughs> I know these days a lot of novels have a lot of uh, sociological concepts. So, and some novels read more like uh, half-baked sociology than literature to me. So I made a conscious effort to avoid economic concepts. Uh, and if it's in, I maybe uh, deal with them humorously. Mm -hmm. But then I think you had another part to the question. It was yeah, I was like, how humorous. do you keep, how do you make sure the reader has the knowledge, say, of the island and, and the oh, people and the culture yes, without the, explaining it to them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought it was very important not to put all the information at the beginning to front load everything. No. I sort of peppered the information on the islands throughout the novel. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it, it becomes journalism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm just glancing at the chat here. I feel like I, just a, a practical question. Do you have any more, uh, more uh, uh, virtual events coming up for the book? Oh yeah. I <laughs> Tomorrow, tomorrow I have one. Uh, it's uh, with the Denver, uh, Denver Lighthouse, right? Which is a you know a oh, workshop. Yeah. Den Denver Lighthouse workshop. That's Lighthouse tomorrow. is an organization a lot like the Writers at Center. Seven, at seven thirty, yeah. and uh, that will be more on the themes of the novel, more thematic. Yeah. And uh, in October there'll be one uh, as part of the Fall for the fall for the book festival where I'll be presenting with uh, four writers uh, from the world. It will be on global fiction. Great. Uh, another question, and I like this one because this is one I don't ask a lot and should probably ask more often is what novelists have influenced you most? What other writers are, are, are people who made you want to maybe work on this project? You know, I can't, it's, I think it's for the reader to decide which novelist has influenced me most. I can say that I read very widely. Let me give you an example. Recently, uh, what I've read, I've read Marlon James, uh, mm -hmm. the Book of Night Women, a very violent book, you know, about slavery in Jamaica. Then I've, I've read David Mitchell, you know, a Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoot, which is about the Dutchman in Japan, you know, in 19th century Japan. Uh, uh, Elena Ferranti, my brilliant friend, which is a coming of age story that takes place in Naples. So when, when you know, you read such a variety of authors, and I read, I've read a lot of, you know, Edward Jones, who I, I, you know, I consider to be my guru, you know, the known world, you know, which takes place in the United States. So uh, with all these uh, influences, it's hard for me to pinpoint who has influenced me most. I have to say that in my younger days, uh, you know, I read uh, V.S. Naipaul and I, I said to myself, well, if V.S. Naipaul can put Trinidad on the map, well, maybe I should try my hand at it. That's great. Well, we're, we're coming up near the end. So I do want to make sure my last question uh, gets in here. And that's the last question we usually like to ask our guest is what's one piece of writing advice you'd give to a writer uh, just starting work on a novel? Do not start with a theme. Do not start by saying, I am going to, to write a novel, novel about colonialism or about identity. No, start with a set of interesting characters and a story. That's my advice. Start with a set of interesting characters and a story. Well, I love that advice. 
Um, Vinod, I really just want to thank you for joining us today. This has been a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, it's a great book. So everyone, please, please, please go get a copy of Silent Winds, Dry Seas. Uh, it came out It came out this week, right? I'm not mistaken. And so it's it brand out, new. Uh, it came out yesterday. Yesterday. Um, so go to your local independent bookstores and find a copy or, uh, or check out bookshop.org and look it up there. And thank you all for joining us. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Thanks to the Writers' Center and thanks to everyone who took the time, uh, you know, to listen. I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoys the book. <laughs>